Hey everyone, welcome to KSSP Podcast. I'm Spencer. And I'm Katie. Today we're going to be talking about addressing difficult conversations. Uh, There's many types of difficult conversations, from confronting someone on their unhealthy behaviors to breakups, to conveying bad news, to revealing a secret. These conversations are all difficult, and some tips can help us to have these conversations in the most productive way possible. In our mini-series today on difficult conversations, we will be going over what they are, common pitfalls, tips on how to have them, and why we must have them. So, what makes a difficult conversation? Well, there can be a few different things. And those, some of, so we'll just go over them. One thing is that opinions could vary. For example, if you get into a car crash, you may think the other person is at fault while they may think you're at fault. Another thing is that stakes could be high. So one example that I thought of was like, if your roommate is thinking of not resigning the lease, that could end up jeopardizing your living situation. And then another Thing that makes conversations difficult sometimes is that emotions can run strong. So another example I thought of was if you feel like your partner is drifting away, that conversation could obviously then have strong feelings behind it. And then any difficult conversation could have a huge impact on the quality of your life depending on the outcome of it. Yeah, so... Um, There's a few examples of difficult conversations we can talk about today. One, the first one is like ending a relationship or changing the relationship dynamic. So yeah, those two are both difficult relationship conversations for sure. Um, We can go over like how opinions are obviously going to, they might vary depending on the people. Like if there's one partner who wants, let's say like an open relationship and then, but they're, they talk to their partner about it and then their partner disagrees. And then also in that situation, the stakes are pretty high because you risk, you know, losing the relationship. They might, if you ask them, they might even just break up with you because that can be a difficult thing to process for some people. And then obviously emotions are going to run strong because the relationship is most likely pretty important to you, I'd hope, if you're in the relationship. Um, and then the second example would be talking to like a coworker, friend, or family member who behaves offensively or makes suggestive comments. Um, yeah, so opinions are going to be- vary on what is offensive and what isn't offensive in that situation um the stakes might be high because if they're behaving that offensively or making suggestive comments like you don't know what their motives are necessarily depending on the situation emotions are gonna run strong usually when people are offended that's pretty rooted in emotion um then yeah so The third example is asking someone to repay a loan from you. Like, obviously, you want the money back and they want to hold on to their money for a while longer or maybe forever, or you know. (laughs) And the stakes are high. At least it depends on the amount that they're borrowing from you and how long they're taking to repay it, obviously. Like, so, you know, if you gave like, you know, a third of what was in your bank account to someone to loan it to them, and then they're not paying you back. That could be the difference between, like, paying rent or mortgage or moving out for some people, like, depending on their income. And emotions might run a little less strong than some of the other examples. There still be some emotion there because you might feel betrayed or disrespected that the person isn't paying you back on time. And yeah, so next example is 
giving feedback to your boss about their behavior or approaching a boss who's breaking their safety or policies. So yeah, opinions are going to vary on whether the rules should be followed or not in that situation. The stakes are pretty high because it's your boss. They can fire you. And emotions, they might run strong, stronger in some people than others, at least. If it's something you feel you need to confront them on, obviously you have a little bit of emotion behind it. And then next example is receiving custody or visitation with an ex or sorry. The next one is resolving custody or visitation with an ex spouse. So yeah, obviously the opinions on, you know, what the terms are going to be for the custody or visitation are going to vary. The stakes are high because you're talking about the safety of your children and, you know, their well-being in general. And emotions are going to run strong because one, you're, you know, most people aren't on great terms with their ex-spouses, especially in situations where there's custody or visitation agreements. Um, so you might have some negative feelings towards them and then you're also, you know, worried about your kids' well-being. So there's that emotion as well. And then the next example is confronting a loved one about an addiction. So yeah, opinions are going to vary whether they should get help or not. Most a lot of the time. Sometimes when you talk to someone that might just spark something in them and they might want to change. But for a lot of people, like if you're confronting them about the problem of addiction, like they are probably not in a place where they want to quit. Or, you know, maybe in some situations it's somebody relapsing and trying to stay sober, but having a hard time with it as well. Or not even just stay sober, but stay away from their addiction in general. And the stakes are high. You're worried about their well-being, you know, their safety, their finances, their relationships, like, especially their relationship with you. Like, sometimes, you know, you might have to cut them out of your life if it's toxic enough. So the stakes are pretty high in those conversations. Emotions are going to run strong because you're just worried about them spiraling into their addiction. It's caused a lot of worry. And the last example is a doctor breaking the sterile field or violating HIPAA or asking a doctor for meds. So I'm going to go over both of these. So like a doctor violating code, um, Opin it depends on the situation if opinions are going to vary. And I mean, I guess that's true for every kind of example. Like, s opinions might, may or may not vary. Usually they will, but not all of the time. And the stakes are high because, you know, this is your health care. You obviously want it done by the book. <laughs> and emotions are going to run strong because... You know, you're fearing for your health. Or if it's someone else in that situation who's getting help from the doctor and these things are happening, then you're worried about them and their health. Yeah. So, and then asking a doctor for meds, opinions may vary. It just depends, you know, how your doctor is and what symptoms you're presenting and if the medication would be the right fit, or if, at least if the doctor thinks the medication would be the right fit, um, versus if you think it'd be the right fit, like the opinions vary sometimes. And then that can lead to a lot of more difficult conversations. The stakes are high, again, because it's your healthcare. And then emotions are running strong just because you want to feel better again, you know? and. Because when you're sick and you, like, are to the point where you need to ask a doctor for a certain type of medication, like, I mean, a lot of the time, unless, you know, you're just medication seeking, but, like, for people who actually are asking for the medication for medical reasons, like, their chronic illnesses and mental health uh, or mental disorders and things like that, like, anything where your health 
is being compromised, um, it's going to make your emotions run really strong after a certain point if, you know, the symptoms are bad enough. It just puts you in a state of, like, hopelessness sometimes, for sure. And then, like, the anxiety of asking a doctor for, the, you know, a medication or even just, you know, increasing or decreasing a dose. You know, asking a doctor about yeah. that. Because, you know, you're just, you feel hopeless, but then, you know, like, realizing that there's a medication that could help you kind of gives you hope. For sure. Like, at least that's just my experience, I guess. Yeah. So what prevents us from having success with these difficult conversations? Um, emotions, for one, can hinder our response to where we don't think rationally. So according to the Cleveland Clinic, adrenaline or epinephrine is a hormone your adrenal glands make to help you prepare for stressful or dangerous situations. Adrenaline rush is the name for the quick release of adrenaline in your bloodstream. This gets your body ready for a fight or a flight response by activating your uh, sympathetic response. And the brain diverts blood away from higher level reasoning sections of our brains and is triggered by activation of the fear centers or the amygdala and hypothalamus in our brains. So the body is preparing for an attack because that's what it feels like is happening to the body when we have to approach these difficult conversations. I mean, that's what the feeling of nervousness is, is that adrenaline being released. Um, well, that's part of it. It's not the whole thing, but it, it definitely contributes to that. So another pitfall is silence. So masking consists of understanding and selectively showing our true opinions. So things like sarcasm, sugarcoating, staying silent, basically holding back the true expression of ourselves to appease others. And avoiding involves steering completely away from the sensitive subjects. We talk, but we are, we talk, but without addressing the real issues. This includes things such as passive aggressive statements, jokes, sarcasms, and more. So withdrawing means pulling out of the conversation altogether. We either exit the conversation or exit the room. This is another form of avoidance. And it, it is okay if you are in the conversation and you need to step aside for a break, but you, you need to come back and readdress the situation once you're calmed down and the other person is as well. And finally, we often resort to silence because it just feels like the easier option. We'd rather keep dealing with the issue than have a difficult conversation. But as long as we stay silent, the issues will continue to go unchecked and many any bad actors will not be held accountable. Another pitfall that we may fall victim to in having difficult conversations is violence. And that can be controlling the conversation. So that could be coercing others to our way of thinking by speaking in absolutes, overstating facts, using directive questions to control the conversation, cutting people off, or changing subjects. Another tactic of violence that we may fall victim to is, or even end up doing ourselves, is labeling as a way to dismiss. And that could be using labels as a way to dismiss the thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and experiences of others. And then attacking also falls under violence. And personal attacks are another way that we can poison the conversation. It makes the other person less receptive to what you have to say as invalidating their experience. It is tempting to attack others in difficult conversations, but the satisfaction gained is fleeting and unhealthy. And another pitfall is that we can feel under pressure during a difficult conversation because sometimes these difficult conversations may feel spontaneous in a way, giving us no time to really prepare for them. But there are ways to plan ahead for these kind of conversations. And then there also may be a lot at stake 
with these kinds of conversations could end in conflict or with the person leaving our lives. And there is a choice to be made in this situation. Do the consequences really outweigh the benefits or are we just being held back by fear? And then another pitfall is when you're feeling like stumped, stuck, frozen in the conversation. And whether it's because you haven't had much practice with these kinds of conversations or haven't seen good role models. And you may have seen a lot of bad examples, so you know what not to do, but that doesn't really tell you what to do in the situation. It just tells you what to avoid. And so you might not even know where to start. And sometimes we feel stuck during these conversations, like we don't even know where to begin or end the conversation. This is why it's important to keep our goals in mind and plan ahead for the conversation and for the multitude of directions the conversation may take. If you think someone might potentially start a difficult conversation with you, it's best to figure out what your feelings and goals are uh, for the conversation accordingly. Uh, we can't always predict when this is going to happen, but if we think about how others feel about our actions, we can best plan for these conversations to lead to us meeting our goals. We may also act in self-defeating ways, which could be passive aggressiveness or subtly implying something negative without directly saying it so that there is room for doubt of what the statement really meant. And another thing could be we end up talking behind people's backs instead of letting them know what's bothering us. And it's okay to vent to others, but doing so to besmirch them without actually planning to address the issues with them is not healthy, and it will lead to biases in those you're talking to. The, then we have the choice of telling the truth or keeping a friend, which... Sometimes you just feel so connected to that other person. You don't want to let go of the relationship. But if the behavior is causing issues in the relationship and they choose to leave instead of change, or if they just choose not to change and continue the behavior, not even attempt to change, um, you know, is that the kind of friend you really want to keep around? Like, is this toxicity, is there a low enough level of toxicity where? you know, it's okay to keep your friend or is this something that's highly toxic and, you know, is detrimental to your well-being and not helping you get your needs met from them. And then we also have the pitfall of having the wrong goals or motives. Some of those Situations could be where you are thinking, if we could just fix those losers, all would get better. But we have to understand that no one is capable of fixing someone who doesn't want to change. We can't control the action of others. We can only control our own actions and associations. And fixing people is a very complicated task that often requires self-motivation to change, along with outside help from others to hold people accountable, such as therapists, friends, and family, maybe even coworkers. And also with that statement, it's also important not to get into the mindset of thinking everyone else needs fixed and that you and your ideals are superior to others. So just kind of going both ways with that type. And then another pitfall under this category could be winning. So we often want to win the conversation. We want the immediate solution when often immediate solutions are temporary. So remember that change takes time. And if the other person isn't willing to change, we may have to let them go. Punishing, trying to punish the other person will not lead you to your goals. Even if it seems to at first, people often find workarounds for the punishment and go back to their old behaviors anyways. Instead of punishment, it is best to focus on boundaries as we mentioned before in a previous video, the best way to state a boundary is if you do X, I will do Y. And then keeping the peace. It feels good to please others. However, pleasing others is not always the healthiest way to handle situations as we often ignore our own needs in order to do this. It's important that you keep your own needs met because if you can't help yourself, then you can't help others. We've got some tips here from a couple different articles. Um, 
I just kind of took their bullet points and I'm going to just expand upon them myself. I'm not going to read the whole thing word for word here, but they did have some good main points. So this is Reach Out in Australia. And it's six steps to help you tackle difficult conversations. So yeah, the first is to listen. Uh, yeah, so you just want to actively listen while the other person is talking to you and pay attention to what they're saying to you and what that means. So if you don't understand something or you'd like to understand it further, don't be afraid to ask questions and don't make assumptions on how the other person is going to react. Take what they're saying for what it is, not as if they have an alternative agenda, unless you know with certainty that they do. Uh, remember that certainty is not a feeling, it's a conclusion based off of the given evidence. And then the next tip is to be clear about how you feel and what you want. So you want to think about this ahead of time. Write down a list of how the situation makes you feel, and then write another list for what you want to gain from the conversation. Uh, this can help you figure out how to best address the issue so that your needs are being met. And make sure to use I statements and not you statements. Uh, don't accuse the other person of anything. Just tell them your observations and how you are feeling and personally affected by their actions and or words. And then be sure not to leave out any important facts or details and don't leave anything you are feeling, don't leave out anything you're feeling either. The best way to get what you want from the conversation is to be direct. And then next we've got look at the issue from their perspective. Think about how the other person is feeling and why they're acting the way that they are. Uh, this isn't a way to condone bad behavior, but rather a way to best reach through to the person you're speaking with. Uh, if you can't understand how they're feeling, then you can't help them to change. So is this something that the person is doing regularly or does this seem a bit out of character for them? This is an important question that's going to help you figure out uh, why that they do or did the problematic behavior and how best to address it. And that if things aren't going to plan, just take a break. Uh, it's okay to walk away from unproductive and aggressive conversation. If you need to take a break from the talk, that is perfectly fine. As long as you don't put it on the back burner forever, taking breaks can be helpful for addressing your concerns. So once you both cooled down, just readdress the conversation from a place of objectivity to the best of your ability. Of course, you're both going to hold biases, but it's best to acknowledge and address these biases in a calm and respectful manner. And then if you need to, having a non-biased third party join you for this conversation can be really helpful. Uh, this is going to help prevent biases, emotional outbursts, manipulation, and more. Uh, therapists are the best option, but if you don't have access to a therapist, that's perfectly fine. You find a mutual friend or family member to help mandate the conversation and mediate it. And then the next tip is agree to disagree. Don't expect the other person to immediately concede to you on your points. You may have differences in opinion on the matter, and that's okay. Uh, if there's still a disagreement, it's also okay to hold boundaries. As we mentioned before, boundaries are different from rules because they don't tell a person what they can or can't do, but rather they let the other person know what action you will take if they continue with the problematic behavior. And then finally, look after yourself. If the conversation doesn't end as you hoped it would, remember to give yourself some love and engage in self-care. Self-soothing behavior can be helpful for helping us to process what has just happened while also remembering our worth. Uh, these conversations can make us feel hopeless at times, but it's always better to have the conversation go in a different direction than hope for than it is to not have the conversation at all. So next we've got psychology. Oh, okay. There. Okay. So, okay, um, similar format here to the last one I, I just did. So first we're gonna look at their key points though. 
All relationship conflicts are caused by interaction effects, not by one person or the other. Uh, during a big talk, be sure to communicate purposefully, offer solutions, and don't blame people. And listening is the most important strategy in difficult conversations, so use empathy and consider the other person's perspective. So, all right, key, tip number one is to have a goal in mind. And as we mentioned in the last article, it's important to think of what our goals are ahead of time. Make sure to have a loose plan for the conversation that'll best help you to reach your goals. And the next one, use non-blaming communication styles. Again, you want to use I statements, not you statements. Focus on your personal observations and how those things make you feel. Never assume how the other person is feeling or why they're acting the way that they are. We also never want to assume what other behaviors they might be engaging in if there's no actual evidence for these assumptions. And then next, we also want to recognize that complex interpersonal problems have complex interpersonal causes. So don't forget to address your role in the situation. This is not the place to, uh, this is not to place blame on you for their behavior, but rather to determine what, if any, interactions between the two of you have led to the behavior. And the solution may not be as simple as getting your way. Compromise is key to change behavior. And then next, you want to accept criticism if it's on topic. If it's off topic, try to steer the conversation back on topic without getting defensive. The best way to do this might be, well, I think your concern is valid. I don't think it's relevant to the conversation. We can have another conversation about that later, but for now, I'd like to be able to focus on X. Uh, however, if the criticism is on topic, really self-reflect on this. Again, do not get defensive, even if you don't think criticism is valid. Ask them what makes them think that about you and really take the criticism in. Don't assume that the other person is the only one who needs to change. Uh, take accountability for these criticisms and make sure their criticism is integrated into the solution and that it's compromised. Uh, don't allow on-topic criticism to take away from the conversation you initially started. You can quickly address it in five minutes or less, but make sure once it's addressed that you steer the conversation back to the original point at hand. Uh, next, we have phase requests towards the positive. So empathize that both of you will benefit from the changes you wish to make. Keep things positive so that the other person is more willing to work on a solution with you. Next, we have don't feel the need for your total victory. A conversation isn't a competition. It's a way for us to reach our goals with other people. Uh, there may be disagreements, but this doesn't make either person right or wrong necessarily. Uh, you don't want to also remember that it may take time for the other person to fully process what you said to them. They may not agree with you that there's even a problem, but give them a little time. A week is typically a good amount of time to wait before seeing if the other person's going to change their point of view or not. And again, it's just, it's better to have the conversation and come to a disagreement than to not address the issues at all. And having the conversation is a victory in itself, regardless of the outcome. Finally, don't forget to listen. We talked about this point before, but be prepared for unexpected reactions, as we are not always going to be able to predict how the other person will react and what they're going to say. You really want to listen to them. Don't just wait for them to finish speaking so you can make your next point. And then I do have some more points as well that aren't mentioned in those articles. So my next tip would be don't use accusatory language. Uh, simply express how you're feeling, what you're thinking, and how this influences your actions. Don't be afraid to hold boundaries either, but don't aim for total control. You can only control yourself. You can't control other people. Uh, think of the serenity prayer. Tell yourself, this is the serenity prayer. Uh, it says, I have the serenity to accept the things I cannot control, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I, I just think that's a really good quote that can help people approach this with the right mindset. Um, yeah, and then next tip for me would be if you need to bring a neutral third party, 
whether it's a mutual friend or family member, a professional such as a therapist, even a clergy member if you're religious, or, you know, someone from your church. Uh, you can, like a church leader, you can uh, bring them into the conversation. And that can often help to prevent things such as manipulation, insults, non-constructive, non-constructive criticism, and tempers being lost. Not that it's always going to prevent these things, but a neutral third party can help mediate the situation most of the time. Yeah. And then I have just a couple of tips here as well. So one of the first tips is just it's always important to avoid common dialogue pitfalls. And those could include phrases such as, yeah, but... Or that happens to me and my group too. Or that doesn't happen to me, so it doesn't exist. And then, or I know someone who, whatever, and they don't agree with you. So any of those just kind of, they kind of, I would say, a lot of times end up shutting down the conversation rather than building on it and leading it to where it needs to go. Like it kind of closes the dialogue rather than opening it, I would say. And then another tip is just try to understand the situation more. So you may need to state your desired outcome, whether out loud or just to yourself in your head, just to let you know. You may want to ask the person for more information so you can try to understand maybe where they're coming from too so that you guys can understand each other because a lot of times understanding helps lead conversations to where they need to go and then acknowledge and validate each other's points as much as possible too another tip is to make sure you maintain focus on the right motive so if you end up finding yourself falling for any of the traps we discussed in the previous video and you can stop in Pay attention to your motives. So the questions you could ask yourself if you find yourself falling for one of those pitfalls is, what do I want for myself, for others, for the relationship? How would I behave if this were what I really wanted? And what does my behavior tell me about what my motives are? And then a common... So another tip is to make an and statement is what it is called. So that will help you avoid the either or pitfall. So first to do this, first you'll want to think of what you want. So for example, you may want your partner to pay more attention to you. So then you're going to think of what you don't want. So again, for example, you don't want to have a conversation that leads to fighting and broken emotions. So third, then you're going to combine the two with and. So for example, that would be, how can I have a conversation with my partner about being more attentive and avoid fighting or broken emotions? So it's kind of figuring out how, basically it's just trying to get your brain thinking about how you can do like achieve what you want what you desire but also avoid attempt try to avoid what you don't want so just try kind of helps get your brain those gears in your brain churning so that you can try to come up with a solution and it helps you think of solutions that you might not have thought of if you only were thinking of those two as separate things instead of thinking of them together another tip is learning to look so Let's just kind of looking, thinking about the topic under discussion and what people are doing in response. So that could be content and behavior or either or. And then you just want to know your cues for when a conversation is turning difficult. And that could be physical, behavioral, or emotional. It's going to be different for each of us, but it's important to understand ourselves so that we can notice that the conversation is taking a turn. Like we just need to be able to pay attention to our own bodies to understand what our cues are, whether again, that's physical, behavioral or emotional so that we can understand ourselves more too. And then 
you also want to be able to see others if they are displaying like silence or violence like we talked about. So just kind of being able to a understand yourself and your cues, but also then kind of start to just pay attention to how the people around you during these conversations are responding as well. And then if you kind of notice that the conversation is taking a turn, another thing you can do is attempt to make the conversation safe. So with that, you could step out, make it safe, and then step back in. And some ways to make it safe is finding a mutual purpose. So you'll want to commit to seeking a mutual purpose with the other person. And with that, you'll want to recognize purposes. So you'll want to ask people why they want what they are pushing for and then separate what they're demanding from the purpose it serves. And then you're going to invent a mutual purpose and then brainstorm strategies to help you guys come to that mutual purpose. And then mutual respect. And that's just kind of finding similarity because a lot of times when we have opinions that vary, we may end up thinking that this other person is nothing like us but it, i think a lot of times more often than not we will end it's easier to find similarities between people between each other than i think we like to admit sometimes so once you can do that it kind of again opens the conversation the dialogue rather than closing it you can and we all should apologize when appropriate and then another tip is contrast to, to make it safe is contrasting to fix mix misunderstanding so with that there's a don't do don't slash do statement so to do that you will address so the a don't slash do statement addresses others concerns that you don't respect them or that you have a malicious purpose that's the don't part and then confirms your respect or clarifies your real purpose, the do part. It is not apologizing. It provides context and proportion, and it's used as prevention or first aid. And then try to have the conversation on neutral ground or places where both parties can feel safe. Instead of having the conversation at your house, try maybe at a coffee shop, for example. Having the conversation on neutral territory will help both of you feel comfort and help you have an equal balance of power subconsciously. All right, and then, so we're gonna ask ourselves, uh, what are the benefits of working on our skills as far as difficult conversation goes? Um, a key skill of effective leaders, teammates, parents, and loved ones is the, cap is the capacity to skillfully address emotionally and politically risky situations and issues. And most influential, influential individuals, so those who can get things done and build on relationships, are those who have been able to master having these difficult conversations. Yeah, and people who routinely hold crucial conversations and hold them well, can express controversial and even risky opinions in a way that gets them heard. And companies and team perform better and can often meet deadlines when they're able to have these difficult conversations. So they, that can be like if they feel like the expected deadlines are unrealistic, are they able to go to the boss or leader and let them know? And if they feel they can and they're able to have those difficult conversations, it has been shown that they can respond five times faster. Like those companies respond five times faster to financial downturns. They save over $1,500 in an eight-hour workday for every difficult conversation they have rather than avoid. It increases trust and influences change in colleagues. And most importantly, people who can have these difficult conversations are better equipped to have their needs met. While I was kind of doing looking up information on difficult conversations and like tips and all that. What I learned is that people need to know how to have a crucial conversation, but that's important as we all know. But I think an aspect 
I think an aspect to also consider is the other person. Cause I feel like most of the tips that I ended up seeing didn't consider the other person's how they would respond. Some of them did though, as we mentioned, but a lot of the ones that I initially was looking into more so considered your response, which is important, obviously, because you, the only person that you can control is you, but I just think it's important to consider the other person when you're having a conversation about difficult conversations. It, I feel it doesn't matter how well sometimes, especially in a work situation where it doesn't matter how well an employee can handle the crucial or difficult conversation if the boss cannot, especially in a situation where the boss has a power dynamic over the employee, whether or not the employee can handle the conversation well. If the boss can't, then that can lead to worse outcomes for the employee, whereas if the boss was able to take the conversation well and the employee wasn't, then it'd more so be a situation where potentially the boss is letting the employee vent or not necessarily letting them vent per se, but just the fact that in that situation, if the boss can't handle the situa- the conversation, the difficult conversation, if they aren't mature enough to have that conversation, then they could fire the employee if they get upset. Whereas if the employee is the one who can't handle it, the boss can more so act maybe as a mentor kind of because they're in usually the leader I guess you like bosses, we like to think of as leaders and guides and men, or we would hope that they would be like that, you know, because they're the boss of us. So we'd want them to be able to help us in that and be more mature. I guess I always would be under the assumption that the boss is the most mature in the situation that in my opinion, that's how it should be. It's not always that way, but that is how it should be. And just that power dynamic, again, I feel is more dangerous when that person in power doesn't know how to effectively have the conversation versus the employee. Now, again, everyone needs to be able to have these conversations and not worry about getting fired. I still believe it's more important that people in charge and power have a better handle on their emotions and know how to have difficult conversations just due to that power dynamic. Yes. And as someone who's managed a team, like someone who's been a manager in the past, um, I would prefer someone to confront me on an issue I'm having rather than not, Uh, especially if it hurts to get, or sorry, even if it hurts to get the criticism, it's important to process the criticism in order to be a good leader. And a good leader shouldn't use their power to take out negative feelings on an employee ever. That's just not acceptable. Yes, agreed. And then... Another area that I feel was briefly mentioned, but not as brought up, I guess, than I was looking into it, that I still think is very important, especially dealing with difficult conversations, would be politics. And just because there's so much polarization right now that it feels almost impossible for people to just have a conversation. If we want to progress as a society, we need to work on having difficult conversations for the betterment of society. Now, that doesn't mean forcing each other's beliefs onto each other. Nor do we, in my opinion, need to fully understand the other side, but we at least need to be able to have these discussions. If we can't, well, then I'd be concerned for society as a whole. Uh, Yeah, instead, we should be having conversations on our beliefs and why we hold them and why it is best for the good of both ourselves and others. There are compromises we can come up with if we're just willing to listen to to each other and see why others hold the beliefs that they do. And it's not always easy, but it's it's something that is definitely important to do. Yes. And I feel like that is especially where that tip on finding similarity can come in. Because at the end of the day, whether we want to admit it or not, we're all humans. We're all going to have similarities. That doesn't negate or excuse anyone's belief that could be very damaging to others, obviously. But at the end of the day, we're all humans. So we need to work on finding those similarities so that we can have conversations. And then also just in any kind of relationship, whether it's romantic, friendship, whatever, uh, it's important to be able to, and I guess 
obviously with bosses too or any like employee workers, yeah yeah any relationship really it's important to be able to speak openly honestly and effectively yeah difficult conversations are extremely important to have whether you whether you're someone with a non-confrontational nature like me or you're someone who tends to let emotions drive these conversations Difficult conversations are a skill that anyone can benefit from practicing. Remember that even if you don't act perfectly or the other person doesn't react in the way you'd hope they would, uh, these conversations are still important for maintaining uh, relationships with others. And that concludes our series on difficult conversations. So we would just like to thank everyone who's been watching, liking, and sharing. Uh, we just want you to know we really appreciate you. And we are just really excited to have you guys along on this journey with us as we see, I guess, where KSSP podcast goes. So we're excited. And as always, you can leave a comment below if you have any topic ideas that you want to hear us go over in future episodes. Yeah, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And we also occasionally do Twitch live streams. So uh, follow us there to get notified of when we do. And don't forget to give this video a like as well as follow or subscribe to our other social media accounts and turn on notifications so that you get notified of when our future or other content comes out. Otherwise, we will see everyone next time.